<laughs> yes, yes, Raji. This is this was. I mean, you took us on this grand journey, and uh, really a very, very wide, comprehensive um, picture of how one is India. So I know there are several comments in the chat box and some questions as well. And uh, we have um, Bijoy already, so I'll straight away go to questions or comments. Bijoy, please go ahead, just unmute yourself and. Yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Vedam. Namaste. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, for your... please, 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 please introduce yourself also. Yeah, uh, let me yeah. know who, yeah, I'm, I'm, who I'm, I'm speaking uh, to. I am uh, Vijay Barik, and I am from Vijawada, uh, and uh, finance professional. Okay, so I'll be, uh, you know, uh, it uh, uh, really, you know, thank you very much for your in-depth and uh, great research on Indian civilization. It uh, took me uh, to the great heritage of ancient India, which are which we are proud of. You have beautifully explained a common thread of uh, music. I, I believe you are a uh, music lover. The passion with which you have explained, you know, the temple heritage, uh, then scriptures, common astronomy, math, rituals, medicine, foods, what not. I have a, you know, uh, query from you. How the professions or the expertise of different states, that part you have not touched in your presentation, how that, you know, helps in uh, uh, the integration, civilization integration. And second is, what are the ways through which young India can help in furthering the integrity? Okay. So the uh, professional part, you're right. I did not talk much about the business, trade, professions, but there's a deep evidence of that all over the place, all over the place. We can start at any period of time. Let me start with Indo-Roman trade. Indo-Roman trade, we know that there was trade between uh, Rome and various ports in India. The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, that is a document that says which are the ports in eastern India, western India, from which the Roman sailors would uh, trade. And what was the trade? They were trading in spices, cotton cloth, and various other things. And we are seeing that even today, if you see where are the cotton textiles manufactured in India, you'll find them in the coastal areas because that is where the factories were in the ancient times, making muslin, various grades of cotton from muslin all the way to linen and other things. They were being traded from ports in India to these places because in other parts, they did not know about cotton. They did not, they wore animal skins and things like that. So cotton was amazing, some product made out of uh, uh, plants. So we are seeing evidence of trade also in Arthashastra. We are seeing evidence of trade in the Silk Route. If you go to the Silk Route, informal trade network between Southeast Asia, China, India, Central Asia, Mediterranean countries, we are seeing enormous activity in trade. If you look at Bakshali manuscript, for example, Bakshali manuscript is talking about the mathematics used in commerce. It's talking, how do you price a product? How do you do conversion? How do you price uh, how many uh, goods you have? Many, many kind of mathematical problems are addressed over there, clearly showing commerce. Arthashastras, again, are talking about taxation and rules for commerce and so on. There is clear evidence that there was trade between various parts of India as well as uh, outside of India. In fact, in the linguistic analysis, we are seeing that there are several coastal communities in the north as you go towards Maharashtra, Gujarat, and so on. We are seeing places named that end with Vad, with uh, uh, other, other such things. So clearly, southern in origin, Puram, Pura, and other these kind of things. So we are seeing wherever there is trade, we are seeing interchange of the so-called northern, southern words, and so on, which is absent if you go to Punjab and places like that. So clearly, we are seeing integration happening through trade, integration happening through commerce, common culture over here. One more very important thing. Kings always invited brahmanas to come and settle in their kingdoms. Why? People are saying there's hegemony and all this nonsense, but that is not true. Even today, various parts of India, we have uh, economic zones or software park where you say, I will not charge you tax. Please come set up your company over here and things like that. Brahmanas are like that. When the king invites a brahmana, he's a repository of knowledge. What does he do with the villages that the king has given for tax? First thing he'll do is an agraharam. 
in the by the river side once agraram is set up with vastu shastra you say the temple is here brahmins live here kshatriyas live here these people live here and so on and so forth then they start a patashala patashala teaches all the children of different communities how do we know it dharampal's work dharampal is calling out about the census of the british carried out talking about how more than 50 to 80% of the class were the so called artisan communities so with this knowledge the artisans of india who could uh, make quality products using mathematics whether it is uh, uh, anything for uh, uh, exchange whether it's carpentry or whether it is metallurgy or whether it is textiles or anything they could make quality goods for export and there is evidence of this in the economic picture of india if you look at angus madison's work if you look at utsa patnaik's work if you look at uh, will durant's work they're all saying india was a prosperous country in the past 33% of the world gdp 2000 years ago steadily falling by 10% over 1000 years and deeply falling the slope changes very much in the british period when they impoverished india so what it is telling us is who had this wealth in ancient india 33% of the world gdp was it the brahmana brahmana has always been a beggar was it the kshatriya no he was the landlord and zamindar was it the vaishya yes and was it the artisan yes artisans were the ones who made every aspect of value for the economy whether you wanted clothes to wear pots and pans to cook at home or a jatka to carry your family somewhere or whatever it was the artisan who made it so artisans were the ones who were the richest in india till the british impoverished them with the industrial revolution that is what we know so clearly evidence of of uh, a trade uh, economy deeply embedded is there i did not talk about that but yes there is a lot of evidence of that in addition how can you use that for today's india well in today's india we need to be aware of these facts people don't know people are readily buying this socialist marxist narrative which says that there's only oppression there's only oppression hegemony anger hatred this has been promoted in the textbooks all the time where is the understanding of this integral unity of the bharatiya civilization where is that where is that understanding that the differences are minimal that is not there differences are played up and the unity is reduced so that's why i'm grateful that baluji had asked me to talk today on unity so it's important that we talk about this to our children and push this narrative more and more so people become aware of these obvious facts we have to hold a mirror to our faces and say this is who we are as a civilization not what the they are telling me in my textbooks i hope that addresses it vijay ji thank you so nice so nice thank you thank you uh yes uh, i i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly or they from barcelona please go ahead with your question yes thank you very much um, well my name is jordi if you want to pronounce jordi. it in the catalan way it's uh, jordi uh I I was I mean uh, VJ made me a uh, a resource of the management uh, foundation uh in 2009 I've been giving many courses that just to show you that I'm I feel very much uh with you <laughs> okay and I've been living in Chennai for for several years also so I know a bit the Tamil uh Tamil surroundings and I've been in in Bengaluru Uh, all over the place but what i want to 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 tell you is that first of all i like very much very much your explanation your your lecture thank you thank you very much and congratulations for all the work you have done uh number 2 there are things that are unexplained um for instance one of them is that you seem to start to you, you say that 1500 bc it was the Uh, reported Aryan invasion uh, the, uh, under discussion that you dispute, <laughs> which I understand. But in my findings, it it happened three thousand one hundred BC, so much much earlier, according to archaeological findings, and this is important because it coincides with uh, Krishna's time, as 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 determined by by the stars as they are described in. Uh, in the mahabharata in the in the ramayana uh, rama has been identified exactly exactly thanks to the stars in the ramayana um, and also other geological evidence for instance at the time when the sea went down enough for people to be able to go to sri lanka on foot without without getting wet or or very little <laughs> 
So there is a number, a big number of variables. And when you take them all together, uh, a synthesis uh, is born. And um, this is, uh, I have very few qualities, but one of them is, for, I'm an engineer, engineer. So I very easily, I, I, I synthesize things from many, from, for a big cloud of things I can synthesize. And I think I have understood. I have understood the past, India's past, Europe's past, and it's all very logical. And it explains something you have not explained, which is why Sanskrit, uh, the language, which is uh, the ancestor of Hindi, uh, uh, partly, partly uh, of Telugu and so on in part, is so similar in many words to Catalan, my own language. And I, I am in Europe, in Western Europe, so so remote, you know, and and this has to be explained. That's fundamental, right? Because I think uh, I, I think I think Jody, Dior, I, I think you got the gist of what you're saying. So let me try to address that as best as I can. So yes. first, I have not read your words. I'll be very happy to read it, but I can see the framework of arguments which you're trying to lay over here. So the first um, issue uh, is the common. Let me take the last issue and go backwards. Your first uh, issue is why is Catalan so uh, similar to Sanskrit? So there has to have been some kind of a migration, and perhaps this happened in 3000 BC, according to you, based upon some of the uh, evidence that you have collected over here. So it's critically important for us to understand all the variables in the scenario that you're constructing. When we talk about a migration, is a migration always from Central Asia? Remember the Urhemet uh, discussion, the homeland discussion happened in 18th, 19th century where they had up to five homelands. They talked about Northwest India, they talked about Germany, they talked about Caucasus. This is old. Talked, this is old. Yes, Very old. Yes, yes. But the point Very is, point is, Past. point is, <laughs> where is the homeland? Where is the homeland? That is the issue. Srikant Talagiri in our times has done an excellent analysis of the evidence present in Rig Veda, geography of India in the Rig Veda and other places. And he has made the argument that the homeland should be in Northwest India. Then the linguistic analysis makes sense. Otherwise, it does not make sense. So that is point number one. So a migration could have happened from India radiating outwards. And that could have happened. That's why Catalan and uh, other European languages related to Sanskrit. Or perhaps it came from outside India into India. Both are possible. And one will have to collect evidence one way or the other and discuss any counterpoints. That is what has to be done logically and rationally. If we look at only a portion of the data, we can construct a thesis on that. But we're ignoring the evidence that is there on the other side. And some of that ignored evidence, one of them is a smoking gun. According to me, the smoking gun is 2000 BCE. In 2000 BCE, there was a 200-year monsoon failure. This is evident in climatology studies and so on, yes, where yes. when monsoons failed, there was out-of-India migrations. And I've shown that with several evidence, cattle genomics and various other things to show that out of India into Mitanni lands, into Hittite lands, and so on, out of India migrations have happened. Similarly, if you look at the, uh, uh, um, the evidence of uh, Saraswati River that is present in Rig Veda, that is talking about a presence of uh, uh, Indians in India that can align with your theory also, 3000 BC. Yeah, by that time, uh, Saraswati River could have been observed. It aligns with that. Now, the astronomy, astronomy. I have pointed out astronomical evidences, for example, on Aditi. Aditi is the mother of uh, all divinities, right? It is Aditi and Diti, co-sister, through whom you have the Devas and the Daityas on the Uttarayana path, Dakshinayana path, according to the Indian tradition. Now, in, um, in what is the name? Aitriya Brahmana. Aitriya Brahmana, there is a statement. There's a statement that the sacrifice, Yajna, had gone away from the divinities and devdas. The devdas did not know where the yajna had gone. They did not know the correct time to do auspicious activity. They go to Aditi and ask, Aditi, can you help us? Tell us where is the sacrifice gone? Aditi says, yes, I will tell you, but I'll choose a bone of you. And they said, okay, ask. And she says, this is my bone. 
all sacrifices will begin and end with me in other words she was resetting the astronomical clock to the aditi to aditi saying vernal equinox will begin and end with me remember indians practiced all the times for vedic rituals based on the celestial clock celestial clock was based on the sidereal ideas sidereal meaning the position of a star at the equinox point or the cardinal points of astronomy it is based on that that can change because of precession the precession of earth happens about 26000 years cycle as precession happens the nakshatra at a cardinal point keeps changing in this case vernal equinox earlier there was some other nakshatra at the vernal equinox because of this what i'm talking about that position had changed because that position changed ancient indians did not know when to observe a certain sacrifice so they go to aditi they reset the clock at aditi once they reset the clock at aditi then they were able to uh, 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 to do their sacrifices if you simulate in the planetarium software when aditi was at vernal equinox you'll find the date coming out to if i'm not mistaken 7200 bce 7200 bce is 9000 years ago and 9000 years ago we got evidence from rakhi gadi evidence from rakhi gadi that there were settlements over there in that time frame we have yes. evidence from dwarka underwater archaeology at dwarka yes. we have evidence at pumpuhar underwater mm-hmm. archaeology by professor ramaswami reported 2 years ago at pumpuhar that evidence is there so we know india was already settled country in that yes time frame and there was yes. evidence of these things so internal evidence of indians is showing astronomical phenomena going beyond 3000 bc going to 7200 bc 6000 i got astronomical phenomena going all over the place so any mm-hmm. theory that says vedic people came in 1500 bc or 3000 bc into india needs to explain what about these calendars is there any evidence outside of india where a vedic civilization has been followed if you go to central asia is there any evidence of yagnas over there is there any evidence of any of these practices it is only in bharatiya civilization we see this as people leave bharatiya civilization we are seeing evidence they lose their ways that is why there is a, a, a caution that if you go outside bharat then you cease to become an arya arya is a noble man other such things you cease to you become uh, 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 various names are given to the people who left india and went so this is the notions that we have so i'll be curious to see your work uh, jordi uh, <laughs> to see what you're proposing uh, however uh, we'll have to analyze it with the evidence that we have thank you very much uh, i agree with most that you say uh, only that there are some small discrepancies that we we should work at i'm i'll be Certainly. delighted to send you to send you my work and to listen to your please 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 rajvedam at yahoo.com rajvedam at yahoo.com please do reach out to me by email i'll be very happy to read your works okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you jody for this wonderful exchange and lighting yes devansh please go ahead hello ma'am so sir i am devansh from vadodara gujarat <laughs> and uh, long back i came across the story that adi shankara oh, yeah. uh, famous shastra rat with mandal mishra and uh, he is questioned that where does he come from and he answers i am a dravida shishu and then the dravid implies that the peninsula region of bharata so if you could throw light here that if this story is at all true and all so the exchange is there and uh, in saundarya lahiri in saundarya lahiri is where adi shankara is referring to himself as a dravida shishu and dravida shishu over here does not mean a race it does not mean a people it means a geographical region where the river the, the seas are meeting that is that is that is what is talking about in not only in that even in tantra vartika you are seeing uh, kumari la bata who is talking about uh, uh, same thing about uh, dravida in the context of a geographical uh, region so in various works not only these there are other works also refer to dravida as a region geographical region not as a people not as a race the dravida became dravidian with kamba uh, uh, kalva Caldwell was the one who wanted to refer to them as racial theory. Once they proposed that Aryans had come into India, Arya became Aryans thanks to Max Müller and uh, others. 
so when when the linguistic category was identified as a racial category as aryans so the people on the south they jumped to it people in the south meaning missionaries like caldwell and pope they jumped to it and say dravida is dravidian and these are our southern people there are northern people so this racial theory took hold on spurious grounds so one will have to analyze uh, the assumptions that they made how valid are those assumptions and if today on the genetic basis on literature basis other evidence we say their assumptions are wrong we must reject these categorizations these are false categorizations that's why i say these identities are manufactured there is nothing called race there is not a single geneticist who say this is race nobody has come and said that if you have this mutation this one this one and this one then you are this race so these notions of caucasian and negroid all these things are not me these are all outcomes of the biblical theory hamitic tradition from have from uh, sorry from noah's children is when the racial theory came it to the white people shem to the semitic people ham to the colored people so this racial theory is uh, got its root in um, uh, assumptions that cannot be justified today um raj you have really brought on so much and uh, i'm just going through the chat there are so many comments of appreciation and thank you acknowledging uh, the wonderful gripping and lighting talk you are absolutely brilliant presentations and there is one very interesting comment slash question from uh, shashi balaji who had also joined us i don't know if you can see us uh so uh, she's asking what have you uh, 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 once once again pratap kumar ji can you please yeah. uh, mute your mute yourself there's a lot of disturbance pratap kumar please mute yourself yes okay. yes thank you um so her question is what have we done in last 75 years of independence it is our duty to write fresh history with all such evidence pratap pratap kumar ji uh, can i mute yourself you can ask your question afterwards Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So, uh, yeah. Shashi, Shashi Balaji, please go ahead. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Wherever we go and talk about all these India's uh, cultural uh, heritage, glorious past, and all, and this has been distorted by the Western scholars and all. But my question is, what we have done in the last seventy-five years after becoming independent? Yes, Shashi Balaji, thank you for that uh, excellent question. So, in my talks, I talk about how our identity has been distorted, murdered, butchered beyond recognition. We cannot recognize ourselves in the narrative that NCERT, the Indian government, or any textbook narrative from Western academia is talking about us. We cannot recognize ourselves, and the reasons are these five frameworks that I talked about: the colonial narrative. the eurocentric narrative the missionary narrative the socialist academia and the marxist nehruvian socialism was one that came with fabian socialism of great britain when nehru studied in uh, london he became a member of the fabian society which wanted to establish a socialist government in uh, in great britain socialist and the marxists are joined at the hip remember i said marxists believe all of history is a history of class conflicts and only by overthrowing the old order old order is corrupted that's their beginning assumption old order is corrupted and that old order must be destroyed in a bloody revolution and then we'll have a classless utopia that is the fantasy that they have socialists believe in the same issues except they believe change can come through the democratic process it need not be a bloody revolution change can come within the, uh, the democratic process but they share the same ideas that the past is perverted backward primitive superstitious and so on in india that past is uh, 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 that that past is um, uh, hinduism in sanatan dharma so by destroying sanatan dharma they hope to uh, 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 say we can establish a classless society what is a classless society well today the socialist academy is in bed with who is going to give them the maximum money you have money from islamo petro dollars coming in in academic uh, institutions all over the world a certain kind of narrative is coming out there you see the church has poured in a lot of money too so certain narratives are being promoted 
over certain others. There's obvious uh, uh, evidence if you look at newspaper reports, if you look at uh, academic uh, conferences being done, if you look at the textbooks and so on. So you ask, what are we doing for the last 75 years? Unfortunately, Nehruvian socialism saw to it that such a kind of thinking will continue. And it continued for several years through a period of innocence from 1947 until 1972. When I was a schoolboy in the 70s, I remember that we still had some very nice Hindu ideas in my Kannada textbooks and other, so on and so forth. However, Indira Gandhi, for political survival, 1972, made a pact with the Marxists for political survival. Narul Hassan, he was a minister of HRD. Communists only wanted HRD sector because they believe propaganda controlling the mind is important for revolution. So they took over the education sector. All the social sciences institutions you see today, whether it's ICHR or whether it is JNU uh, or any social, up to 40 to 50 institutions are set up by Narul Hassan. If you had to be appointed as a vice chancellor or a professor in any of this, you better be a socialist or card carrying Marxist. So they edged out the emic. Emic is the internal practitioner of the Vedic culture. He was edged out over the last 50 years, 1970 to now, completely edged out. You cannot find a single professor in any Indian university, history department, or archaeology, or anywhere because of the activities of this particular uh, group over here. They have controlled NCRT, they have controlled everything. If you open the NCRT textbooks and see the editorial boards and see their affiliations, you'll understand what I mean. There is not a single person who can say he's of the Bharatiya civilization who is allowed to give input in the Indian discourse. That is because they all share the ideology that Hinduism is backward, primitive, stagnant, and must be destroyed and thrown out for progress. That is their ideology. What will it be replaced by? Well, they're quiet about it, but we know what it is currently being replaced by. So uh, uh, I, to answer your question, it is there is no political will since 2014 to make this change happen. We are saying that the BJP has not done much at all in this arena in, in reclaiming the space, intellectual space. There is still no promotion to the emic scholar the Sanskrit scholar is probably somebody living in utter poverty in some uh, uh, B town or C town in India rather than the A class towns in India. And uh, uh, there's no uh, place for him to amplify his voice because he's uh, uh, languishing in places like Mail Kote in Karnataka, in places like that, where people don't generally go to find discourse or scholarship. This is the unfortunate reality of where we are. So Shashi Balaji, I think uh, uh, yeah. an unfortunate I sequence agree. of politics. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I fully agree with you. <clears throat> we need a political will because yes. we are still slaves. We are still mental slaves, cultural slaves, linguistic slaves. This slave mentality has to be changed. Completely agree. Completely agree. We are mind colonized and we don't even realize that. We don't even realize that. The first step to detoxification of our minds is to realize that we have been played with. Only knowledge has got the power to set us free. If we are going to invest in that knowledge, understand some of the things I'm talking about, starting with uh, great scholars like Arabindoji himself, starting from his works and so on, once we read that, we understand, we understand that our minds have been played with so much. 200 years of deracination has led us to where we are. So first step to reclaiming who we are is to understand who we are through history. So we can connect back I, to the past. That's not happening. Can, it's not happening in our education system. And I'm, and I'm sorry to say, unfortunately, we can see the same story in many Asian countries, that Asian cultures are all being lost. They are losing. Everybody wants to be westernized, right. culturally, right. everywhere, right. everywhere. Right. Recently, I was in Mongolia. I was so sad to see that people are becoming so western-minded. They are losing their own identity. Global civilization doesn't mean anything for when we are losing our regional identities, our national identities, our cultural identities. It's all fading. And Westernization is leading to Christianization. Very modernization, true. modernization to Westernization to Christianization and then losing. Now what is happening in Europe? Right. 
Right. So it may, it may, I hope it may not happen in other countries. What is happening in Europe? Oh, yeah, we, we see we see clearly see evidence of that happening, and the reversal must happen with our reclaiming the mind space. Yes. And that is not happening in our educational institutions. It's not happening in the political discourse. It's not happening in media, movies, elsewhere. And there are few of us, you know, we are like mad people going around there and uh, talking about these things. <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, this is where we are. Hopefully, the voices can be amplified by forums like this, by people who believe in this strongly, and the change can come. But uh, you're right, the change politically can be like a tsunami if it happens at the political level. It's happening at a groundswell level. We have to wait for the tsunami to build up for generations and generations. Yeah. It yes. might be too late by then. might be too late. Right. right. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shashi Balaji, for this very interesting exchange. Uh, Bala Sundari ji and Shashank, I know we are already half hour beyond our time, but uh, as you started building up your, uh, you know, case, uh, Raj ji, I knew that this was, you know, going to bring in very interesting questions. So if you can keep your comment or question very, very brief, Balaji and then Shashank. Um, and uh, please go ahead. One of you can unmute yourself. Balaji, you would... Uh, we can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Regularly following and in fact, Several of his talks I would have heard three to four times keeping my notebook and it's very, it, it, may, it should not be hyperbolic, but he is my uh, professor for studying Indian ancient history. Yes, and I should... And also... Nothing else. No, because we are all hoping for the best. And now only one small question. Why is it... He mentioned about the Sanskrit people. I'm the daughter of a Sanskrit Acharya. I know what it is from Gurkul Kangli, Vedalankar ki putri Now, the problem is whatever is written in English by English writers, not Indians, or in Anglicized in Indians, that is translated into Indian languages. Recently, I found extensive Telugu literature and deep in Hindi also, which is historical. In, beyond the Bhagavatam, Poth, and I don't want to go in details. I'm deep into Telugu, I'm doing translations also. So, being from your side, an IT technology person background. So, why can not small groups be formed to translate into this so-called international language, our, Indi our literature from Indian language? Beluji, and our greatest Indology professor and head Shashibala Ji until we translate into this so-called communication language all the great hidden treasures of India in Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Hindi, Bengali, we will not know what is Indian history. Very we will true, just very follow true. Max Miller and Campbell, that's all. This so, uh, Balasundari ji, yes, I completely agree. In fact, in the past, I've written that the uh, languages that we have are rich repositories of culture, practice, history, yes. and so much more. Each exactly. language is a rich repository. And we are losing that when we lose the regional languages. So, you're absolutely right in feeling strongly about this, That's that we need to save this heritage. A very rare book my father mentioned about the Satavahana, and I somehow managed to get one printout, oldest printout, out of print book, the entire history of Dakshin Bharata of the Satavahana period, written in poetry in Tain Telugu. I'm stunned, no way the book is even mentioned. It's a very dilapidated state. I digitized and read it from my grandfather's collection. So please, if we can make groups of people to translate vice versa. Please, Delhi for our Auro Bharti also. Yearly yeah. two, three Indian books. Balaji, now that you are part of our volunteer team, we'll definitely sit down and talk more the about other it. talk also. I spoke about only reverse yes, translation yes, yes. should take place. Right, 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 right. Nothing else. Yes. Thank you very much. My Thank professor. You. My, my dearest uh, professor, most admirable professor, Dr. Rajvedamji.
ధన్యవాదం ఫర్యూ so definitely you all are scholars you know you are into fields of research and all for common people um my my silly question could be you know how we want to um, you know increase the knowledge about our society our civilization are there any simple books that probably parents or common people can have like maybe a list of couple of them that we can read and we can pass it on to our child you know not to going deep as you guys are like you guys are doing amazing uh, uh, work on these things if we are uh, lucky enough we'll get to get to those literatures but just in common terms is there anything we can reach out maybe i'm i'm also happy to reach out to any of you to get such references there, there are many such uh, i cannot tell you off hands about this go to websites like kohona kohona is a coalition of hindu parents in north america i know they maintain a list of books for okay. children and so on there are several other groups that maintain lists of books um i know that i have been impressed by a series called pride of bharat if i'm not mistaken pride of bharat or pride of india that's the name of the book series it's by a publishing okay. group in bangalore bangalore who had done that i was very impressed with the accuracy of what they were saying written for a level of children and their parents so you might want to look okay. them up they also talk a lot about her age of india and so on so there are several books out there uh, uh, one one will have to uh, get the references from groups that maintain them when i was growing up obviously my choices were amar chitrakatha and they were uh, bhavan's journal and there were yeah. tapovan prasad yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. uh, publications like this that uh, led me to uh, understand our culture a lot more so in present times i think there there are you have to look for those publications i can't tell you off hand yes uh, and if i can just add uh, shashank ji there is um, one very interesting and important uh, publication from sri aurobindo society it's called india is one it's a quite an old publication but it has been reprinted several times over and over it's a compilation okay. of the ideas that uh, several of the ideas that uh, raj ji was describing through evidence to mm-hmm. highlight the whole oneness the unity of india and uh, yeah. on the occasion of this 150th year of shri aurobindo shri aurobindo society is coming out uh, is in the process of publishing small booklets which are again compilations Great. of words from shri aurobindo the mother and several other uh, early disciples of shri aurobindo with the mm-hmm. theme india and her mission these are all going Great. to be available as free ebooks to be downloaded from uh, the publication wing of shri aurobindo society so i was just speaking to the person who's compiling last week uh, within maybe a month or so they should be out so keep checking our wow. renaissance facebook page we'll uh, put the link there when they are done yeah okay one one quick silly question a last one uh, because we all have like um, um, uh, a group of people here is there any way we can get like the contact details so that you know people like us can can connect and you know get more information will there be a list of attendees or something that will be shared later okay actually um no sorry am i audible yeah um no yes. actually we don't but we will be able to we can easily share um, our uh, speaker's email address he's already shared it few times rajvedam@yahoo.com and also our you can follow us on um, our facebook page and on rajji's facebook page as well um and i'm just going to type in my email address in the chat box Great. so um we do Thank these so kinds much. of events um if not every month at least every couple of months so that way um you know you can stay connected Yeah. thank you so much thanks a lot thanks for giving me a chance thank okay. you okay uh, i see one more hand vivek can you make it quick and short because i know i don't want to keep uh, raj ji from his breakfast it's still <laughs> i'm sure he has a yeah. breakfast um, yes. ma'am i'm just having uh, first thing the vande mataram um, 
I want to say the one thing to the Raj Vedangi, and I am following you from the last two years during the lockdown. Thanks to the Sachin Gupta and uh, uh, Subroto Gangupadhyayji from IHR, IR, and they introduced me your theory to me, and and number of times I've seen your live uh, from um, webinars and all. The Ireland is when from uh, Jain University. Uh, I've done my masters in archaeology and Indian uh, Indian history. So for my PhD, I want your help to take the, such a subject so I can make a one landmark in front of the uh, the progressive historians, old historians. So I want to do the PhD on such a subject which is very essential for debunking the Aryan invention theory and, and other topics. So I want your suggestions in the future time. I just want to say this much for this time. I will write to you. Certainly. Can, you can. Yes, please, please reach out an email and we can see. And I, are you in Jain University in Bengaluru? Uh, sir, I've done it, um, my master's from the Ujjain University. Vikram Ujjain, University. okay. I heard of Jain I, University. Okay. Yes, sir, I live in, I live in Ujjain. And okay, I'm, okay. I'm a practicing lawyer. I'm a, um, doing the practice in Delhi High Court. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Vivek ji, and thank you to all the participants who joined for this session, and also the wonderful comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, really, lots of appreciation, and uh, you know, saying thanks to the wonderful, enlightening presentation that you have. So I, I don't know how to thank you, Rajji. You really, like I said, covered us very wide ground. Uh, and we started off <clears throat> with this theme of highlighting or celebrating the unity of India. But there were like many lessons in music, in architecture, in language, you know, script, so many things. So maybe we'll have you back uh, going a little bit more in depth into some of those areas as well, because uh, this series of talks, which is inspired by the Bharat Shakti exhibition, those were, those were all the themes that we covered, you know, the music. So along with you, maybe we'll have a few more other people who are actually practicing uh, music, musicians or something like that. So I look forward to really having you as part of our resource persons team. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for spending this much time with us. Really, really very honored and privileged. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on this forum.